Let me welcome, let me welcome Eric and Sean for the talk about Tor and give them a warm round of applause. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Morning. So we are going to, to present you our work on, on the Tor network, or more specifically on dynamic cryptography bug doors and how to apply it to try to break some encrypted network. So I did a joint work with uh, uh, Sean and our colleague in, uh, we now is back to Tanzania, the University of Tanzania. So here is the agenda. And most of the time, people speak about breaking cryptography. But in fact, most of the time, we think about using huge time-consuming uh, exhaustive search which is, of course, for modern uh, cryptographic system, quite impossible or totally impossible. But most of the time, we observe the fact that we have the situation of armored door on a paper or cardboard wall. So why bother to try to break the door if you can go through the window, find the key under the carpet, or even crush the wall? So we have to take the, the environment, in a very broad sense, the operating system, the users, the network architecture, the protocols, uh, to determine whether it is possible to, go s to, to use and exploit them to bypass cryptography. Everything is, of course, in a context where we all suffer from breaks of protocols of tools that are imposed by standards, by uh, organizations, and we have to, to work with them. And maybe more concerning is the fact that we all are suffering from some sort of standardization of mind. If you consider, uh, for example, the development of cryptographic IPA, it is very difficult to, to try to develop uh, without considering those norms, at least for some products. So, in fact, we have to remind that the, the aim is not to have the key or to break the system in an academic view. The very final aim is to have access to the plain text. So, in fact, we have extensively worked on what we call dynamic cryptographic backdoors, mostly uh, implemented uh, through malwares. Otherwise, well, we can do the same job, but with trapdoors. And it has been possible, it is a, a few uh, results we obtained, to bypass, for example, IPsec-based encrypted network. You may use Tempest or not, it's not the issue. And for example, we have applied these techniques to break some military IP encryptors. In this respect, there are bad, most of them are badly implemented. And what is very important to stress on and to keep in mind, and everything has been tested, or we like to go from theory to practical stuff and to verify that everything works. So all these attacks are very efficient. So now we are going to, to, to explain how it is uh, up to us. It is possible to apply this kind of techniques over a, a network, encrypted network like Tor or any other uh, network in, uh, of this type. So the working, the starting scenario uh, can be either an undemocratic country. We want to monitor, not to block. The aim is not to block the, the network. It's quite the contrary. Just to monitor and to survey all the political opponents. May it be outside or outs uh, inside or outside the country. Or any small group uh, of bad guys. So... Um, a few elements I think that are important to, to keep in mind. Um, more and more with the evolution of uh, regulation, national regulation in Western countries, the use of malware is now something well recognized and accepted. And I have no exception in mind from France to Yannis State. And German, Germany or United Kingdom, now it is well accepted that police forces, intelligence forces can use without a restriction malware. So it is not a dream, it would be more a nightmare, it's reality. 
and they are beginning to develop many, many capabilities in, in this respect, and probably China is among the most um, advanced country in this area. So we would like to present our attack not like a single attack, just deploying malware. No, from an operational point of view, from a tactic point of view, it's not, it's not a good idea. In fact, we would like to present an attack which is in fact more related to the way military are thinking. And to organize a coordinated multi-level attack with small surgical strike in order to combine to a very final effect. And I have um, I had many discussions with officials in different countries and they say, well, if you manage to break at least 1% of the traffic, it's already a success. So no matter if we, is the, the, the attack is very efficient or only efficient, but if you already manage to, to have this success rate, it's already a success. Of course, we think it's possible to do, to do far better. So here are the agenda. So Shen will present all, all the network part. I, I will try just to, to recall some part about dynamic cryptographic trapdoors. So in fact, it is very interesting to notice that most of the implementation relay, uh, rely very importantly on the environment and the operating system. For example, under Windows, uh, I have only a very few exceptions in mind. Um, they all rely on the Microsoft cryptographic API. You have just to hook this API to do what, what you want. You can modify algorithm in memory. For example, we managed to scan for Xbox of the AES in memory and to replace those Xbox with, with Wix Xbox that, of course, the attacker knows in advance. You can turn between modes. You can do many, many things. And the word dynamic comes from the fact that, in fact, you can play it only during a limited window of time. Just stop, then come back to the attack. It's fully customizable. So, of course, if you consider the static security, the mathematical security, the algorithm has not been modified as a changed since everything is in memory. So, for example, here we use the cryptgen random, which is the most common used uh, function to generate for example, uh, uh, initialization vectors. So, here, for example, we, choose, uh, we want that the malware modify the cryptography in memory between noon and 2 p.m. So, we, you have, it is part of a, very, a, very, a small part of the malware we have, we have developed. So, here we fix the, uh, the message key for a limited period of time. So why fix the message key? Because in this case, all the messages that are going to be encrypted will be parallel ciphertext. It means that it is easy to detect them. Among many, many uh, encrypted texts, you can detect them in a polynomial time and break them as well in polynomial time. Just the fact to reuse the, uh, to fix the IV. So we have developed a crypto, uh, crypto analysis library exploiting this fact, and you will be surprised how many encrypted traffic can be partly broken with, uh, with applying these techniques. Of course, we are considering stream cipher modes. So how to do that when you have, for example, ECB or CBC mode? Well, that's where uh, there is a very interesting point because, because in fact, since the contest of the NIST, uh, National Institute of Standard and Technology, to promote a, a, the AES. In fact, they impose some sort of standardization of mind to develop around cryptographic library. As a consequence, many developers are writing their library in the same way, most of the time. So there is some sort of standardization of mind. So if you explore this, you can do many things. You can change many things in memory, uh, by, uh, with malware in order to weaken the cryptography. So, for example, here you have during the cipher init, you have a byte which defines a mode, and then you just change a few bytes in memory and you switch from one mode to another one, which is actually very interesting. 
So, how to use that? So first, I would like to stress on the fact that we, we do not have anything against stores. This is not the issue. Actually, uh, at the present time, it is the only available network uh, of the, this type. We have made uh, experiment on other, mm, well, non-public networks, so it is, of course, impossible to publish. So I think that it is a good uh, field of experiment. But once again, it is, our aim is not to say uh, uh, to have something against Tor. So, well, uh, you will find everything where I explained the library, the, the Tor Extend library, the different data are available either on the uh, the wiki of uh, this, the conference or on the, this link. So, Shen has developed a very interesting library. You have the Google Earth uh, map of everything. So, in fact, we have tried to consider the Tor network as a critical infrastructure. Many, when you deploy some brick, in fact, you don't know whether you will have local weakness or, uh, and how to exploit them. So, in fact, it is not the total technology in itself that we, we, we analyze. In fact, it is the fact that is, we exploit the fact that it is deployed by volunteers make, uh, using their own security, uh, computer security, uh, and, on the, of course, uh, using weak protocols. So, I won't uh, recall how it all works. There, are, uh, there was a talk yesterday. Uh, so, just remind that in fact you have to find a circuit of three nodes, three onion routers, randomly, every time you want to, to exchange uh, secretly and anonymously. So, you have here very quickly the uh, key negotiation. In fact, there is a first uh, level to negotiate a secret key and to make sure that all the three nodes have the same key. So about the previous attacks, there are, there, are, there are many, many attacks, so I have just mentioned uh, some of them, but of course you will find everything on the Tor, uh, Tor Foundation blog, I think they, they, refer, they are referencing everything. So in our attack, in fact, we try to work at a very high level and low level at the same time. So first, you have to um, make intelligent step. You have to try to have a, as possible, as complete possi view of the network. How many onion routers, uh, hidden uh, relay, uh, relays, and so on. So, in fact, in this respect, our attack just follow what military are doing. Intelligent step, planning, and conduct of maneuver. So, Many people say, okay, we have broken Tor. No, once again, it's not, it's not the issue. It is a deployment of Tor. Because the core concept, up to me, is rather sound and elegant, but it is deployed on a very um, uh, uh, imperfect world. Weak protocols. Uh, we also use some protection mechanism that we have turned against the network. Or, and, and of course, uh, every volunteer is free to use is on security rules, and just imagine the same in a big, a large company where everything is, is free to choose his uh, operating system to secure or not uh, the, his uh, computer. Well, it will be a nightmare, honestly. And up to me, the use of crypto is not a good thing. Everything you, every time you want to exchange secretly, of course, if you use crypto, it means that you send, send noise because crypto encrypted uh, stuff is just noise. Very high, uh, large entropy profile. So of course you focus attention. Up to me, you have to add transmission security, for example, steganography. So, in fact, from a very general point of view, we just select some weak nodes. So the, weak, the, the weakness issue may depend on the, uh, your view. And we try to force the route uh, to, uh, through those infected nodes. So according to Digelin and some authors, in fact, there is a general for interesting formula uh, which has a claim that if you control M onion routers, of a total of n, you can control this percentage of the traffic. So the aim is to 
increase the value of m and to reduce in a way or another, another the value of m. So we will infect m uh, onion routers and then we will try to de uh, decrease the value of n, it, I mean the number of onion router through, uh, you can go through effectively. So the general description of the attack, you can use a botnet, so I will say a botnet, but of course you can uh, use uh, several small botnets in order first to infect some um, nodes and then to deny, to block or to congest uh, the other one. So it is a general scheme of, of, of course Sean will present uh, in more details. So we have among many information, in fact uh, we have developed in our, uh, in our school a test network at Ashley Lecture which is rather close to the reality, at least statistically speaking, and we have validated everything on, on this architecture. Uh, some parts have been validated on the um, real network and Sean will make experiment using the real network. We are not connecting to our, the, our uh, architecture. And uh, the question is, can we trust the network, Tor network? Or, well, I will say the, the things differently. Is it possible to, for a country to exploit the weaknesses uh, that we have mentioned in order to, not to block Tor, but to control? So, from a general point of view, step one, you just identify, the, it is an intelligent step, you uh, identify a subset of weak uh, onion routers, you install the dynamic trap doors and so on. You modify the AES in control mode in order to fix the, the initiation vector. And of course, we do not modify the OER integrity. Everything is in memory. And after that, we try to selectly, selectively deny access to the uh, on neutral we did not manage to infect or to control. So of course, you have to, uh, to establish a, a complete map of available uh, nodes and then to deny according to three different uh, techniques. So uh, you will find on the website complete Google Earth map with all the, uh, the different nodes so I won't show it here for, um, but in fact we have identified uh, slightly more than 9,000 uh, uh, routers. Over 9,000? And, uh, well, you have the description here, so we have uh, observed that nearly 60% of OER are in the EU, well, slightly less than 13% are in Asia. So, once again, there is a complete map, uh, uh, either they are under Windows, Linux, or it is hidden or not. So, so election, now. Um, so Tor works with, we have what we call bridges and we have relays, as explained at the talk yesterday. So the bridges are supposed to be like a way to prevent countries or governments or the adversaries from denying access to Tor completely. So, but then there's always a way, like, so there's, there's a way for users to actually get the bridges, which is also a way for the very same attackers to get the bridges. So the normal ways to obtain the bridges would be from the website, the bridges website, or sending an email, or there might also be other social ways to actually receive bridges. So the TOR software actually provides a control protocol to enable you to script it, or to actually communicate with TOR directly build circuits or make requests, attach streams. You can do almost anything with it. So uh, we have extended the Ruby controller for Tor that, normal, that is normally used to build circuits or just to connect to Tor. So you can actually make requests with the library and do a couple of other things with it. So. Normally it's possible to get just three bridges at a time from any IP address you go to. 
then pro probably after an hour or so, you might be able to get more bridges as another three, but you get only three at a particular point. So with this library, you'll be able to request more bridges using Tor exit nodes. Um, we were able to obtain about 70 in 10 minutes, and 70 distinct addresses in 10 minutes, and about 200, over 200 in just one hour. So the, our goal was not to get all the bridges, we just tried, and then you actually obtain over 200 bridges within the time using this short script. So I can give a demo about how this is being done. So I've just connected to the control ports to show, so you can actually see some of the events that will come up as I run, when I run the library. So this. Sorry about that. This would just connect, this would do this 20 times using different circuits and I, if the circuit is not built in three seconds, it will, still, it will just try to get the bridge either way and then continue. It could probably be done faster or some circuits may not be actually completed in three seconds. So it's just a sample. The first part of the script I ran was just to get fast exit nodes and fast guard nodes to use for the circuits. And then the script I'm going to run is just picking anyone at random. I'm not selecting 
any particular entry node or exit node. Then the exit node is, I'm going from zero to 20. Let's just pick the first 20 fast exit nodes. You can actually see as it tries to build the circuit, and when you see this succeeded, then you know it probably got. Okay, it doesn't come back. So, yeah, it has put the first three bridges it got, and it's keep trying. It has gotten six. But um, right now, this has also been limited, so it doesn't exactly it doesn't get all the nodes immediately. So the bucket of bridges that it gives out using exit nodes has been limited for this reason. So that, yeah. But then, if we actually keep going, or you actually use all the exit nodes, you should be able to get a large number of bridges normally, just not now. So the library is actually easy for just about anybody to use, and it's easy for anybody to script through the pages. So then the vulnerability, um, with the descriptors, the cache descriptors are actually distributed to just about every node, you have over 2,000 relay addresses that are actually there. And then it's like you give an archive a list of 2,000 addresses and you tell them, okay, check if these addresses are vulnerable to anything. Of course, you might have zero day vulnerabilities and then you have a number of them that might be weak and very easy to compromise. And including Windows and Apple nodes. which might be easy for an attacker to infect with malware to use for the attack. So then the vulnerability scanning shows that about 30% of the ORs are vulnerable, 41% um, of which are Windows, and 19.6% run a Unix flavor. And this is in terms of the number of the nodes and the percentages are likely underestimated. Well, about 20% of them actually have critical severity, but it's what is to be expected of a voluntary-based network. Um, it might be beneficial if there was a way to actually tell clients or volunteers that, okay, your system might be vulnerable to this, or it just runs the test, and then it knows what exactly you can do to help, so it doesn't get attacked by an adversary. So the attack, the goal of the attack was to try to force a client to go through three specific nodes. That's you're not trying to block the Tor network completely, but you just want to control it within a limited time when the dynamic, when the cryptographic backdoor will be in place. So you would have to use a number of availability attacks. You could, it could be similar to the great firewall, you resetting the clients. That's, but our, all, most of all these availability attacks will only work if you have the complete list of the network already. So you still need all the bridges and all the public errors that are available. And with the rate at which the, bridge, the release actually change addresses, um, DHCP, you need to keep this list updated to have the attack work. So then the, another way would be you could actually spin packets on the network or have a kind of congestion just to exhaust the bandwidth on some of these nodes. So, um, previous attacks have been based on the congestion approach or even the packet spinning. 
you sending packets to multiple nodes at the same uh, to multiple nodes in the Tor network. And Tor, with Tor, it used to be possible to actually build very long circuits. You could build a circuit of say 90 nodes. You see, you have errors in your logs if the client actually checks it. But then, how many users actually check their logs frequently when they use Tor? Most people, you probably prefer the GUI. Just click a button with um, Vadilla, and then you connect, and that's about all. So, by default, um, Tor will choose the fast nodes and nodes that have high uptime based on the metric. But then this metric is also published in the consensus. Your bandwidth is there. It's like you tell the attacker, okay, this is how much packets you need to send to keep this node really busy. And then if I can send a packet through your node, say 10 times, the same node as I build a circuit of three nodes and I cycle through that three nodes, say 10 times, it just keeps going. It has a multiplicative effect on the size of the packets I'm actually sending. So the goal of this would just be to keep the packets in place, just to occupy these nodes, prevent them from having time for um, other nodes, for other requests from the clients. And then, then again, it's not going to be played like all the time. You don't need to attack all these nodes at all times of the day. You're just trying to control them. Say, today you want to um, implement the, you have the dynamic cryptographic backdoor, and then you know the specific time or specific day that it will, that's, it will come to pass. Some countries might decide or some governments might decide to actually try this at that specific time. Of course, the tall metrics will, you see downtime in the um, number of clients connecting at that particular time, or it may appear as if the, um, say country or government is throttling the attack, the network for the users. Users just won't connect to the specific nodes at that particular time. And then the attacker just has to, either he has pre-compromised nodes on the network, or he has a botnet or other, um, other nodes is able to compromise and implement, uh, install the malware. So long as you have all these nodes in place, they work normally at all times. At all other times, they work normally, but then at the specific time when it will be attacked, the clients will only be, only be able to connect to these specific nodes. So, and then this can also be set in a different way, such that the attacker can actually distribute the map to say different nodes, and then he has a map of nodes he wants to block at a specific time, and then he sends packets and just keeps the packets in play, keep, sending, keep building circuits, and then it's, it just keeps going on and on. So yeah, I said I was gonna demonstrate how the long circuit or the packet spinner works. So yeah, I'm going to pick a circuit of three random nodes and then build a circuit of 15 nodes that's five loops over those three nodes. It's, the random nodes might not always perform as the attacker wants, because some nodes will actually have different access requests, that, or different access policies that will prevent you from making circuits with the next node you're trying to, or the next hop you're trying. But then here we can see, this is the first node. This is it again. This is the second loop. This is the third. This is the fourth, and this is the fifth. 
So I can also show that we can browse through this. So yeah, I'm using Calico with this. So I'm going to try to I disabled the auto attach mechanism of Tor. Yeah, we can see. Okay, right now the circuit has been closed. So I can, I'll have to rebuild the circuit before I try this again. But then again, this, this doesn't work with the new version of Tor anymore. <laughs> but then, if you use the old clients, it still works. So, but um, there have been mechanisms in place to prevent this, but then it just can't be put to use until all clients, everybody that uses Tor, has upgraded their versions. Uh, okay, maybe I could get back to this after. Circuit has been closed again. So maybe I'll just do this after. So then for the TCP resets, it's, it's not a, a new thing, resetting packets or blocking nodes. The whole attack is based on you using just about any availability attack that is out there. Your resets or ways to congest the network. So the resets 
has been there. Some ISPs use this to prevent clients from accessing some services or different ports. So on like your typical reset where you have to send reset packet both ways, for Tor, you just need to send the reset packets just to the clients that's trying to connect and then even if the relay sends the packet back to the clients, the client rejects it and it tries to pick a different relay. So this will go on until he probably picks your malicious node which you have in place. So you still have to rely on the randomness to, of Tor to select those nodes that are vulnerable. So the other thing would be if the client tries to build a circuit using first the entry, probably a malicious node, and then the next one isn't malicious, you might want to block that also. So that can, that can be done from the nodes you've already compromised using just about anything. So then the whole attack would be in this form where you have the botnets infect, you deny access to some nodes that you are not able to infect using whatever means you have. You could do the reset, you could, it could be some other forms of denial of service attacks and then you have ISPs also doing the reset attacks to the clients. And the denial of service attacks will continue until the client uses the nodes you want him to use. So, the alternatively, you might not need to. Could you move up your microphone? Okay. Al alternatively, you may not need to block access to all the nodes, but then just the ones with higher bandwidth or higher metrics than the ones you have on the network. So, you might have some nodes on the network already that have high bandwidth or with an eye uptime. Uptime is not really a problem. You just need to leave your nodes connected until when you need it to work. So, but then the bandwidth might be the um, question because you need more nodes with bandwidth. And then the attack continues the same way. So then the second version of the library also allows you to build circuits in circuits instead of just building long, one single long circuit. So, with the new version of Tor, you are only able to build a, a circuit with three nodes. So, but then if I want to build a circuit and still have the multiplication effects of sending packets through this, I'll have a circuit going through another circuit and then a third one, and it could also go in the same way you, as in, however you want it to. So this. The, one, the drawback with this is the exit nodes must be chosen carefully so they don't have like restrictions to the next hop, that's the next entry node you're trying to connect to. So sometimes your entry node might be on port 9001 or some other ports, that's the URL port, but then you have to choose exit nodes that allow access to the, entry, to the next hop. And you can actually send, an attacker can actually send packets using either of all these proxies just to increase the um, congestion. So, just to, a few words about the malware we have developed. So, it is very complex code uh, um, implementing a lot of things. So, of course, since we are able to deploy malware, you, 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 we can fix the key. Of course, it is in constant time to, to decrypt since we know the key in advance. But generally, it's more efficient in this case, precise case, to just to fix the, the IV. And then the decryption and the detection of weak ciphertext is in polynomial time. So, uh, once again, there is a library that we have developed in order to detect and break. Uh, it is possible, uh, we have developed a lot of optimization techniques. For example, if we have only one single file with t plain text tagging techniques and so on, and if you use uh, the, in the library the detect single file.c, you will see how it works. So it is possible, of course, to make a lot of things. And the malware is able to adapt 
to the fact that, in fact, since we only force routes uh, through infected nodes with a high probability, it may appear that, in fact, uh, uh, since the probability is not close to one, that it is. It, uh, he cannot, some keys uh, uh, un, un, remain uncontrolled, so he is able to detect that and just to say, okay, I do no, nothing. Okay, it is only small bricks that then you have to combine in a very random way according to your scenario. It is just a framework, uh, uh, attack framework. Uh, you can play, uh, you can replay it, change the time window, everything is possible. And once again, everything is in memory. We do not modify the uh, settings. Well, from a more general point of view, uh, of course, but it, uh, if you know many of the nodes, you could simply block them, but, well, it is not our intention. We just uh, sh want to show that it would be possible to bypass crypto by some sort of uh, surveillance and monitoring. So, once again, the discussion is, and I totally agree with, it is, uh, of course, impossible to have the exact figure. Uh, it is not exact science to have the exact figure of uh, success probability. But, well, even if we manage to break at least 10% or even 1% of the encrypted traffic, up to me, it cannot be accepted. <coughs> so, well, once again, I will stress on uh, some very critical point up to me. Uh, it is very surprising to see that, in fact, there is no high-level auditing of OR security. It is, uh, the volunteering is very nice, but if everyone does what he wants without control and security control well the the security of the the wall infrastructure is limited to the uh, insecurity of the, a few a few ones so it is not possible uh, and of course uh, when you have uh, many many vulnerabilities and flows well it's very easy to infect without giving uh, too many details we have been very surprised not to say shocked that for example https machine was so badly configured that it was possible to collect to catch the secret key instead of the public key so i'm not sure it's a good thing of of course once once again i'm i'm, I'm convinced that using cryptography alone is not a good thing you send noise and if you send noise, it means that you have something to hide. So up to me, steganography or steganography comes uh, other uh, transect security uh, tools are far better. And of course, using TCP, you know what you you, you may you may find. So. We hope, of course, since our work, uh, for example, the spinning attack has now a limited effect. So I. We're happy to see that, in fact, we have some, somehow contributed, contributed to better security for Tor. I think that some measure in order to maintain the activity uh, of Tor and to enable uh, far better uh, security, I think, yes, forbid Windows uh, Onion Router, well, it, it may be a little bit drastic. But in fact, it would be nice maybe to enforce some scanning, to, to use some scanning tools and to deliver some security certificate for Onion routers. Okay, you are valid for the service, you can go on and join in the Andrew group. But I'm, I'm convinced that it is very mandatory to detect weak hours. To be clear, an attack cannot work if all Onion routers cannot be infected. But we are very far from this situation. So that's why I, I, I think that part of the solution, the most part of the solution, is to enforce some high-level security policy managed from the, by the Tor Foundation uh, to deal with, to, to manage the security of all the routers. And of course, prevent scripting, since part of the security relies on the fact, relied on the fact that some really bridge were hidden, well, prevent scripting in a way or another. So, as a conclusion, in fact, well, you have a number of comments, but I will stress on one fact that less and less sophisticated attacks will be the fact of a single step. You will have single, uh, multiple, innocent-looking, surgical strike, little touch, 
with combination will produce final effect. I had the, the occasion uh, since two years to analyze some sophisticated at attacks, um, mostly coming apparently from China. Well, just deploying one single malware, I think it's over. Now I just change the part in memory, I do one, I send a document, and, 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 and so on. And the combination of all those effects makes the final attack. And of course, from the victim point of view, it is quite impossible to prevent, quite impossible to detect, for the single reason is a combinatorial effect. How to survey, to monitor, to compare everything, so it is impossible. And of course, if you want to design trapdoor or backdoors, you have to do the same, just to split everything in multiple innocent looking parts. So, uh, well, Midterm works. We hope that infection will go for a PhD on that subject. But uh, I think that using steganography will, uh, to have some sort of steganography version of Tor would be nice. Uh, to enforce some memory protection, we are actually working for uh, different companies about techniques to prevent uh, attacks in memory. And once again, I would like to stress on that point just enforce over uh, high-level security policy. So, maybe you want to make some comment? No, no, no. So, in fact, it is so, some change that appeared recently. And, Sean, if you want to... Um, the, on the Tor project website, we can see the draft for future crypto proposals. Um, well, the main thing is, I think, since it's modif uh, modification of the keys in memory, the fix could actually be done by the operating system or even the crypto APIs developers, so that they prevent such attacks by the malwares. But then again, the application developers sh could also should also consider protecting the applications against such attacks, pending the time when the API developers release such fixes. So if there are memory protection techniques, they would be able to fix, they would be able to prevent such malware from affecting their applications. And Tor being a critical application, something should be done to protect this in the memory. And then for the congestion attacks, there's a paper about the comparison of datagram which could be a start, since UDP might not have the same congestion problems as TCP, but then it could still have its own security vulnerabilities in the end. So, that's about all. Thank you. Questions? Well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, talk. And I would also like to remind you to use the feedback system on the talk. Feedback system is available in the FAR plan if you select that talk. Now we still have time for a Q&A session. Um, could you please raise your hand if you have a question? We'll start at the back of the OK. <laughs> OK. Here we go. Okay. So you said that there were 30% vulnerable relays. Mm -hmm. The Tor protocol balances load by using the faster relays more often than the slower ones. And in fact, the Tor network has about 2,500 relays now. And a small number of them are very fast, and the rest of them are quite slow. So I would not be surprised to learn that the 30% of the relays that you consider vulnerable are less than 1% of the network by capacity. And once you are only compromising a small amount of the network, that requires you to do a much larger denial of service attack against the rest of the network to make your attack work. So I guess my question is, what fraction of the network by capacity do you believe is vulnerable, not just fraction of the network by relays? Right. No, it's a very important question, but it's, diffi it's difficult to evaluate 
uh, without making experiment on the real network. No, the, all the consensus values are public. The bandwidth values are public. Everything's easy to do if you specify which relays you believe are vulnerable. You can calculate that in polynomial time. Well, well but then again, even if you said the, um, the bandwidth is uh, much higher, as in the nodes that are not vulnerable have a high bandwidth, if the attacker is actually forcing packets to all these nodes, as in all the specific nodes, and then it goes in a loop, whether circuits, true circuits or packet spinning or whatever, the bandwidth of, this, of each system might really not have much effect, since you're actually trying to overload each of these systems with the congestion. So instead, the number of systems that would be available would be the question. Say you have a system that has 20 times the bandwidth of A. I just have to use it in my circuit 20 times, or I have a circuit that loops through it, or... But the result of this is that you basically need to attack every Tor relay and knock it over, and then there are none left, yeah. so you have no computers that you... You have no relays that you control, and then your attack is, I deny service to the Tor network, not... I target users and learn what they are doing. In fact, um, I think we don't target any specific user. That's um, probably the, the main point. We just for, um, deploy the malware, catch what we can, and decrypt what we can. Right, but if you own roughly zero of the Tor relays... <laughs> hmm. No, I, d I do not agree. There is one solution. We have exchanged through emails. It is to do the, the, the to deploy the attacks through the network for real. Are you ready for that? I am ready. <laughs> so, um, just to be clear here, you cited, I think it was like uh, on. I don't know, the original design paper where you talked about controlling M over N nodes or something like that. Um, an interesting question here that at least comes to mind here is that almost every single proposal, every single fix, all the change log, some of the things that Roger wrote, that I wrote, that George wrote, um, basically all of that was stuff that was already published. So what exactly is new here? Is it the crypto backdoor where you have to already root a box in order to do it? Or, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I see in the original design paper of Tor, which is seven years old, the packet spinning attack, which was previously published, work. I mean, no offense to the guy that wrote some yeah. software and demoed it, because that was actually the contribution. Um, but what is the actual attack here that is new, that is novel, um, that we have not already worked on actually stopping with Proposal 110? I mean, I put in the disabled debugger attachment long before you ever mentioned this stuff. And uh, so w what's actually new here, Eric? Most of, you're right, and it has been mentioned in the, in the slides. In fact, we start, as any work in scientific research, we start from existing work, you're right. But unless I am mistaken, I have never found multi-level coordinated attack. We just take many bricks, we have improved some of them, we have developed part of them, inspired, of course, from Murdoch, Danesis, and so on, authors we have mentioned, you're right. But in fact, the, the new, the new uh, aspect, in fact, lies in the fact that we combine everything not to block. Most of the time, people are trying to block. The, uh, no, we don't want to block. And we try, we, we, we show that, in fact, it is up to me possible to um, control the cryptography in a way or another, just combining those bricks. And the concept of dynamic uh, trapdoor, I'm sorry, but it is totally new. Okay, so I don't know about everybody else in this room, but I was writing user land rootkits like a long ago, and that included being able to backdoor the random number generator. That is also not new. Sorry, and can you repeat? I didn't writing backdoors mm -hmm. for the operating system APIs and for, say, mm -hmm. like user land APIs and changing the output of those functions is also not new. And saying that to a crowd of people here, I think it's important to note that I bet if we ask a sample of the people here who has ever caused their crypto function to have a zeroed IV or a predictable key based on time or random number generator with a fixed output, anybody other than me ever write something like that in the room? Okay, we got a couple. 
So, I mean, I guess the thing is that you could also have summed up this talk with one slide, which is you have a botnet and you start 10,000 Tor nodes, which is part of the original Tor design threat, and you don't have to do any congestion whatsoever at all, and you control M over N nodes. And so the question is, what, what is the real contribution as comparison to just a basic Sybil attack, which is the word that we would use to describe this in the literature? And I don't see any real difference here, and I didn't even see you decrypt any traffic, which is quite a bold claim. So I would, I mean, yeah, fire it up. No, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure to understand because, in fact, well, how to say that? Mm. I think it's first for the crypt for the cryptographic backdoor aspect. Okay, you mentioned, but uh, if I well understood, in fact, you mentioned side channel attack and so on. Here, we modify in memory a number of things in such a way that first, from the defender point of view, the, uh, the traffic seems still to be encrypted, respect every random gener uh, random randomness property and so on. But it is possible to decrypt it. So, I'm sorry, but unless you are giving to me uh, references. I would be happy to have one. Uh, it, uh, this aspect is new. Okay, I'm sorry. We yes, have no, I, I, okay. I, I know what you, uh, it is a, a very uh, a critic say, okay, you have just to fix the key and send the key. But from a malware perspective, you have to open socket. You have to do many things that uh, antivirus are supposed to detect. Here, we just modify we just make an innocent looking modification in memory. Of course, you're right, I could just fix the key and send uh, uh, through the traffic. But from an uh, antivirus perspective, it can be modified and it can be detected. Uh, I can fix the key in advance. Uh, you have an anonymity network. You can build a circuit mm -hmm. through the relay and you can leak a cryptographic key any way you'd like. So it just okay. I'm, I'm sorry, we have other questions, questions from the internet as well. Yeah, there's here one question. It says you dis disclosed uh, breach IP addresses on your blog. Mm -hmm. uh, this directly helps censors. Why are you deliberately harming the Tor project by doing that? Why uh, uh, we disclosed it? Yes. Yeah, just to be sure to do. Yes. At the very first time, when we had exchanged with the Tor Foundation, they say, okay, your attack is exaggerated. And in science, you have to, either you're wrong or you, you, uh, you give a proof. Listing the addresses was a proof, the first. Then, and I, I agree, I'm convinced that many people have probably designed equivalent attack. So we have to be very humble. If we are able to do that, other people have probably already done that. For example, China but they don't publish the, the list. So honestly, I think that in, secu in security, if you know there are some risks, I think that making them public is, is a good thing because people are able, who, uh, who own those machines, are able to see, okay, my machine has been detected while it was supposed not to be. So now they are aware. Okay, <coughs> next question so from problem. here. Or, or we just uh, publish nothing, but I don't think that uh, security through obscurity is a good thing, whatever we may paint, we may think. Publish your backdoor. I would like, honestly, I would like, but, well, I, I want to remain free because there are still regulations. But I have published... Uh, publish it, you publish it. Because it's, it's source code, it's... Okay, source no. Code. Uh, uh, it's better to do, I think that source code is far less efficient than mathematics. And we have published everything. Ju there, is, there is two possibilities. I give you a fish or I learn you to fish. I do prefer to give mathematics in order to program a lot of different versions. Source code is just one, uh, one instance. Yes, but the thing is that Excuse me, please. Uh, the guys from the talk project, please get together with Eric after the talk so us normal people can ask questions, please. <laughs> Thank you. So, quick my question. Um, uh, Tor client usually uh, uses guard nodes. I'm here. Oh, sorry. Uh, it usually uses guard nodes um, three in the default config and they change slowly over time uh, once a month, if I remember correctly. Um, if you cannot um, own such a guard node of 
of a, a client. And also, um, these guard notes are very fast notes. Uh, you would have to put a very large traffic through it and uh, effectively only can uh, deny access to the Tor network. You did not mention guard nodes in your presentation. Have you not considered it or uh, how do you deal with guard nodes? The thing with the attack is you're not exactly congesting. You're not, you don't have to congest all the nodes you intend to attack, but instead, some of them might just be blocked with your typical reset attack. Some might be, if you can't overwhelm it with traffic, then you might, the attacker might actually block it using other means necessary. So it's, it's not about the guard nodes having a high, every, the list of fast guard nodes are available to everyone, including the attacker. So it's, it's more like a local attack. If I wanted to go and see everybody here, and I know exactly where the guard nodes are, I can, if I have some guard nodes on the same network, I will try to limit the nodes that you have access to using whatever means necessary. I can choose to block some of them. I could actually leave some of them to be available. As a, so you, you think, okay, it's available, but then I'll try to throttle the bandwidth to that specific node or I make it available for a minute and then after it's unavailable, but then your nodes will actually choose nodes randomly. It will try to specific ones, it says okay, it fails, and then it moves on to the next node. So the aim is at some points, you actually select the malicious node. Okay, any more questions? Right. Then I would say thank you very much and a warm round of applause.